Hi, everybody. Welcome to Colorado Springs. I'm uh, very pleased to welcome our keynote speaker for the opening session tonight, uh, Kirk Goldsberry. Kirk works today as a vice president for the San Antonio Spurs. Uh, prior to joining the Spurs, he was a visiting fellow at Harvard and assistant professor of geography at Michigan State University. Uh, did his PhD at UCSB in geography. This summer, he worked on the gold medal winning uh, Team USA basketball team as a chief analyst. This is actually Kirk's, uh, not, not his first NASIS, <laughs> believe it or not. His first NASIS talk uh, in a NASIS audience was in 2004, um, with subsequent participation in a quite a few other NASIS conferences in the years that follow. The one uh, that he gave back in 2004, he uh, referenced when I invited him to be the keynote for this opening event, and he accepted the invitation and said that he was looking forward to make up for that atrocious presentation. <laughs> uh, so I'm looking forward to that tonight. That's setting a pretty high bar. Uh, he also has two beers and a coffee, so we're, I think we're, we're ready to go. <laughs> True NASA spirit there. Uh, on a more serious note, Kirk's work is at the intersection of data science, uh, sports analytics, and cartographic design. Um, he's certainly the only cartographer I've ever seen appear on ESPN, uh, garnering a slightly larger audience than his final AAG talk in 2013 in Los Angeles. He's one of just a handful in our mapping community with the coveted blue check next to his Twitter name. And uh, much more importantly, though, he represents, I think, the potential that cartographers have to make serious analytical and creative impacts on just about anything you can imagine. So please join me in welcoming Kirk Goldsberry. What I said was I wanted to see if I could duplicate that terrible talk in 2004. So apologies in advance, because I think I can. I think I can. I will. <laughs> Trying to keep it terrible. Earth, no. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, in the esteemed tradition of critical cartography, I've decided to read directly from printed papers here this evening. <laughs> Thank you. At least for a little bit. After all, what is more engaging than a man reading aloud from his papers? But before I begin my scripted remarks this evening, I would like to thank Anthony and all of our kind hosts and the organizers of this fine event. It's meaningful for me to be here with you tonight in Colorado Springs. I mean it. <laughs> You'll be able to sense these feelings are real by the look on my face when I look up from these here papers. <laughs> but alas, there's no time for such a meaningful glance just yet. Just time for a man reading aloud from his papers. Thirteen years ago, I delivered my very first conference presentation at NASIS in Portland, Maine. At the time, I was a first-year PhD student at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And I didn't know it at the time, but I really was an idiot. <laughs> I would go on to produce a mediocre dissertation that evaluated how cartographic artifacts could help us better understand automobile congestion in major cities, a topic Jacques Bertin might have called the semiology of traffics. <laughs> I spent much of my youth studying maps and the art of cartography, but I don't think I think about that time enough. Those were some good times for an idiot like me. That's one thing I want to talk about this evening, cartographic studies in America. But before we get there, a quick aside about my clothing choices this evening. <laughs> As the keenest of you, may have already noted, I am wearing both a shirt and trousers, not to mention shoes. In 2016, when you're invited to give a talk like this, one thing you have to consider is how to dress. Naturally, I'm terrible at this, but that doesn't mean I don't deliberate on the topic. We all do, some more than others, but we all do, even silent Andy Woodruff. People are visual creatures. 
especially cartographers like you and me. Our clothing choices are one of the most important ways we craft our personal brands. You can't hear any words, but we talk with our clothes. Yes, we do. Even silent Andy Woodruff. Fashion is just one visual language we speak and we hear each day. I was visiting with the great Cindy Brewer at Walker Building at Penn State last month. I was giving a very short guest lecture when suddenly I was compelled to remind her young learners of Arthur Robinson, a man who some have said is the father of academic cartography here in the USA. Professor Robertson, <clears throat> the other Professor Robinson, sorry, <laughs> advised the great Judy Olson a woman whose giant boots I would fail to fill years later at Michigan State. Now, Judy didn't literally wear giant boots. That's just an expression I use from time to time. Anyway, when I think about Robinson, or Robbie, as I learned, that was his nickname from Waldo Tobler, back around the time I gave my first ever talk here 13 years ago. When I think about Robbie, the first thing I think about is the logo of the State Department. Robbie's brilliant compromised oval projection silhouetted on a daily basis behind John Kerry's compromised oval head. <laughs> but I don't usually think about that very long. The second thing I think about when I think about old Robbie is Cartography 101. Back in the opening pages of his seminal textbook, Elements of Cartography, Professor Robinson proclaims that human beings have developed four distinct methods for encoding and decoding information. And he goes on to say that the abilities for individuals to do so have four distinct names. The abilities have names. And last month at Penn State, for some reason, I was compelled to talk to Professor Brewer's class about those abilities and those names. The first ability, according to Robbie, is literacy which is the ability to encode via writing down words and the ability to decode via reading the words. The second ability, he says, is articulacy, which is a lot like literacy, but instead of writing and reading, the encoding is done via speech and the decoding is done via listening. It's kind of like we're doing now, except nobody is listening. <laughs> and of course, my current presentation style, the style of the great critical cartographers, demonstrate this, that, at very least, I am literate. See, I am reading from my papers. <laughs> the third way, Robbie says, we encode and decode is mathematical, and he names that ability numeracy. The ability to communicate via things like math equations and computer codes. Lastly, in that opening passage of his seminal text, Professor Robinson talks about graphicacy, which is a silly word if it's even a word at all. <laughs> Still, the idea is very real. And Robbie says the ability to encode and decode messages via graphics and graphical language is super important. And that along with things like photography and cinematography, Robbie says the sciences and art of cartography fall squarely within this fourth realm of communication. I often use that passage to contextualize what we teach and learn in my cartography classes. But as a learner myself, I was never one to neatly, car neatly car car uh, excuse me. <laughs> compartmentalize the lessons of my cartography professors. I was always try trying to apply them to other domains of my own life. Sometimes back in grad school in Santa Barbara, I'd have one too many mugs of Earl Grey tea and start thinking wacky thoughts. I always loved the idea of encoding messages visually. Obviously, this is a skill practiced daily by artists, graphic designers, and great internet pornographers like Silent Andy Woodruff. Oh, cartographers. <laughs> cartographers. Sometimes literacy fails me. But isn't the ability of graphicacy much more potent than the narrow conventional applications we preach about in cartography classes? In a way, aren't we doing this all the time? like a young child drawing our family on a piece of construction paper, aren't we perpetually encoding messages we wish to visually send to others around us? Aren't things like body language and facial expressions additional examples? And if so, then isn't my clothing choice here 
one of these choices too. Are Robbie's ideas potent for realms beyond map making? For many of us, our wardrobe design decisions for big branding events like conference talks are aspirational. How can I craft the right visual message for my brand? How can I dress to impress? How should I comb my hair for my dissertation defense? What color pantsuit should I wear for the debate tonight? Red, white, or blue? <laughs> How orange should I dye my old gray flesh in advance of my big concession speech next month? <laughs> Cheers. Still, the choices for a man my age dressing for an event such as this include a few interesting broad archetypical motifs. Should I go with the Ivy League scholar, the chill tech fella, or the NBA front office executive? These are three wildly different aesthetics, but each on its own would be accepted by this audience this evening. Back around the time I gave my first conference presentation here at NASIS in 2004, my PhD advisor, the fantastic French scholar, Professor Sarah Fabricant, could be quite hard on me. Sarah was as mean as they come, man, but the kind of mean that makes you read harder and think harder, and I owe her a lot. Anyway, she used to make fun of me for how I said the name Jacques Bertin. I told Sarah, I'm from the greatest country on earth. <laughs> and as long as we're amongst the amber waves of grain and these purple mountain majesties, I'll call sweet Jackie B anything I damn please. <laughs> sure, I can't articulate French names as perfectly as they do over in Gay Paris, but I'll never forget the time I watched Sarah eat her first ever peanut butter and jelly sandwich at age 40 years old. We all have our own cultural limitations, Sarah. Anyway, the Ivy League scholar motif with its tweedy formality and its Bostonian prudishness markets a brand of academic achievements while also connoting a certain respect of tradition. Maybe that's the kind of virtue I want to signal here this evening, but sometimes when you dress like that, you just end up look, looking like you're about to go out on some kind of fox hunt. Then there's the tech fella look, that comfy Zuckerbergian call to informality, a bold visual reiteration that us tech fellas are a different strand than our capitalistic ancestors. We're not your father's businessmen, no siree Bob. Check out this whimsical typeface on my undershirt and have you seen the foosball table in our break area? But sometimes I think those draping sweatshirts aren't just sweatshirts, they're smoke screens, a sleight of hand designed to disguise certain basic facts that certain types of young folks really wish weren't true. In the same way that Silicon Valley is the Detroit of our time, sometimes I think hoodies are just the Argyle sweaters of our time and vans are just the brown Oxfords of Silicon Valley. Sometimes I think those foosball tables in the break room are exactly like the smoking lounge at GM 50 years ago so I didn't wear that either. I suppose now that I work for an MBA team, I could wear a nicely pressed Italian suit, or at least give, uh, or at least just a nicely pressed suit from Suit Supply that I hope you mistake for a nicely pressed Italian suit. What messages would that send? How would that affect your perception of me and my brand? Who knows? My point is that there is visual encoding and decoding everywhere, even when we get dressed in the morning. Which textiles will I cover my nudity with this morning? Thankfully, each of us made such design decisions today. <laughs> we evaluated the visual variables of our options, and for better or worse, this is what we ended up wrapping ourselves in. This is what Jacques Bertin might call the semiology of fabrics. Okay. <laughs> Maybe the long, the last five minutes were just a long-winded setup for that terrible joke. <laughs> or maybe I just wanted to accidentally call Andy Woodruff a pornographer. Anyway, I'm just here to say strange things happen when you apply the teachings of folks like Sweet Jackie B and Cindy Brewer 
to realms outside the traditional safe spaces we associate with conventional map making. Even dopey, obvious applications of our most fundamental techniques can get certain people excited. I know it because it happened to me, you guys. For example, one magazine recently accused me of changing basketball forever. At first, I found that thrilling. Wired Magazine making me out to be some kind of change agent for the sport I love most. But then, on second thought, I did not like this. Aside from basketball and maps, I also love Pringles. <laughs> and if somebody told me there was a fellow somewhere that changed Pringles forever, my first reaction would be to be mad at this fella. <laughs> but I guess one implicit message of my appearance here tonight is to establish something interesting about the state of cartography in America. I'm just here as evidence that even obvious and rudimentary applications of our educations to unusual domains can elicit bizarre levels of enthusiasm and even lead to hyperbole amongst media, media types. Friends, I am far from a genius, you know that. <laughs> and I'm far from the most talented cartographer in the room or any room where Eric Steiner happens to be. <laughs> but there have been many days, particularly days between 2012 and 2015, when I may have been the most popular cartographer on Twitter. This on the slide you see is the kind of cartographic mastery that gets you 5,000 retweets in 2015. <laughs> Genius. But back to my education and Jackie B's visual variables. That talk I gave 13 years ago, my first conference talk ever. I promised Anthony I would try to find those slides for you guys tonight. And uh, I found them, unfortunately. <laughs> Which is a minor miracle if you know how organized I am. But as my creative writer, uh, I have those slides with me, and uh, those slides are going to show you uh, that I'm an idiot. <laughs> just like my creative writing teacher at Penn State used to tell me, show people you're an idiot. Don't just tell them you're an idiot. <laughs> I thought this was really important 13 years ago. Classification choices in uh, match legends, looking at the amount of change between map frames and how that would vary in choropleth maps depending on how we classified our data sets. And then we did this and we looked, oh boy, there's a lot of change. And, <laughs> you know, that's my master's, that's what a master's thesis looks like. <laughs> All right. I thought I could do that for one minute, but it turns out I couldn't. <laughs> um, all right. You know, Waldo Tilbury used to tell me, and a lot of you, that he was the first person to build a computer animated thematic map, right? Remember that article? The first law of geography was buried in that article. Um, 1970, but as you can see here, this is a Michigan State University professor who was using the SIMAP program in 1967 to build uh, an animated map with a computer. And uh, when I first found this, I emailed, I still email Waldo back and forth, but uh, I emailed him and uh, I said, Waldo, do you know about this? And he never replied. So. <laughs> the first law of honesty. I don't know. <laughs> I meditated on lots of different stuff as a cartography student, from animated maps to the semiology of traffics. Regardless, in retrospect, here's the thing about Robbie Tobler 
Fabricant, Brewer, and others who taught me how to encode and decode. They'll teach you. Uh, I'm just sniffling because that's my Trump impression. They'll, <laughs> they'll tell you they're going to teach you how to encode visual messages in savvy new ways. They'll instruct you on how to spill the ink just the right way. They'll teach you how to sneak tiny little potent pieces of rhetoric inside those trustworthy choropleth maps. They'll talk about choosing the right projection and data classification. They'll spend hours on typography or how to apply Jackie B's visual variables. They'll lecture you on the principles that guide symbolization. But all the while, there's another sleight of hand going on, the real magic trick. All the best cartography teachers perform is something else altogether. The slick trickster figures behind the lecterns also burden effect and learners with a hyper-aware, hyper-vigilant decoding system. They don't just teach us how to build maps, they also make us obsess over the look of maps and the visual messages that form them. In the same way that DeLillo may roll his eyes when he reads a, down, a Dan Brown book, I imagine the world's best cartographers have a hard time just relaxing and reading all the visual language around them. Everywhere they see flawed cartography, tacky design decisions, everywhere flawed choices. The best cartography educators help us kick down the doors of perception, but they don't teach you how to close them up. Unfortunately for many of us, the semiology of graphics does not come equipped with an uninstall option or the number of a good therapist. Nor does the ideology inside the book include tidy borderlines. And it's hard for any of us indoctrinated into the world of Bertin to not dissect or decode the semiology of fabrics or the semiology of Anthony Robinson's goatee. <laughs> what does it all mean, man? Between, two, between 2012 and 2015, I had the distinct honor of writing for a now deceased website called Grantland. It was a magical place, but it's dead and gone now. At Grantland, my work would appear twice a week alongside some of the best writers on the internet, the tallest dwarves of contemporary literature. But no writer at Grantland was better than my dear friend Wesley Morris. Wesley was one of those beautiful minds, and he has generously devoted his career to sharing it with us as he writes about the movies. In my opinion, Wesley is the best movie critic in the world right now. But he isn't the best movie critic of all time. That, of course, would be Roger Ebert. We all know that, especially Wesley Morris. Roger Ebert died on April 4th, 2013. And it was, when it was time to write about that, we all knew Wesley was going to knock it out of the park. He didn't disappoint. On April 5th, 2013, Wesley published a piece called The People's Critic, remembering Roger Ebert. In the piece, Wes expertly describes Ebert's contributions, but also uses a personal anecdote to demonstrate how Ebert informed Wes's own critical thinking. Ebert was Wesley's greatest teacher. He talks about how Ebert's reviews changed his understanding of how to read a film. For one thing, Wesley writes, I did not know a film could be read. That's the graphicacy revelation right there. I did not know a film could be read. In a time where more and more information is increasingly encoded in more and more visual media, it's important that we're teaching learners how to decode contemporary encodings. But are we doing that? We spend hours in school learning how to read and to write, how to do math. But for many of us, we don't learn how to read visual languages until we take our first cartography class. Sure, we are learning about encoding ideas with visual language, but just like Ebert taught Wesley, we are also learning just as much about decoding it too. Sometimes I wonder about my friend Wesley. Can he ever just watch a movie anymore? Has his hyper-aware visual literacy killed his ability to just sit and watch an old Tom Cruise movie like Top Gun and let the story wash over his mind? Or is Wesley's mind too visually acute for that now? Now when he sees Top Gun and Tom Cruise on cable, is he just caught, 
So he's just caught up in what Bertin might call the semiology of mavericks. <laughs> maybe you're like the magician Tom Patterson and love mapping the mountains, or maybe you're like Don Wright and love mapping the oceans. Maybe you're first obsessed with the earthly phenomena and second obsessed with the representations of those phenomena. I don't know. That's none of my business. I'm not that way. If the strange twists and turns of my own career as a cartographer have taught me anything, it is this. First, there are no convenient bounds at the edges of cartographic reasoning. Cartography itself is a state with no tidy borderlines. Our fair discipline can't map neighborhoods. Hey, where's Steiner? Can't map neighborhoods, man. Where's Andy? Just give it up. No tidy borderlines, you guys. Um, all right. Now, where was I? I'm not used to being a critical cartographer. <sighs> Our fair discipline itself defies the convenience points, lines, and polygon data model at the heart of contemporary map making. For many of us, it's obvious. You can cartograph everything. Second, in the so-called big data era, many amazing applications of cartography are waiting to be done. To paraphrase the great bluesman Robert Johnson, the stuff we got can bust your brains out. In a time so ripe, with so much spatial data left unmapped, the world yearns for more and more cartographic reasoning in more and more unconventional places. It's a golden age for our clan. However, you wouldn't know that by the current state of teaching and learning about our fair discipline. To teach and learn about cartography in 2016 in America is also to teach and learn about geography. And maybe that's okay, but as we all know, the state of geography in the academy is far from golden. That was supposed to be a slide of Tom Cruise. <laughs> My friend Jeff Blossom is hearing a song. I had the privilege of working with Jeff for two years at Harvard from 2011 to 2013. And during my time there, part of my job was to go around spreading the gospels of Humboldt. And part of my job was also to teach my listeners about the plight of geography at Harvard. Man, did we have some good times back in Cambridge. People found it funny when I said, in 375 years, Harvard College has eliminated exactly one academic department, geography. And that line always killed. <laughs> then I would say, many of the country's most prestigious private universities would soon follow suit. And before you knew it, geography was largely absent at almost all of the Ivies. At this point, people would be laughing very loudly. Then I would say, nowadays you can't find geography at Princeton, Stanford, Northwestern, or even the greatest university of all, Trump University. <laughs> then I would say, and since many of the country's best universities don't have geography at all, doesn't that also mean many of our country's best learners never get a good chance to even take one geography class? At this point, everybody would be crying from laughing so hard. And my friends here at NASIS, at a time when big data requires more and more visual encodings, doesn't this also mean then that many of the world's best learners never get a good chance to even learn about contemporary cartography? They never hear about Bertin or Tobler. Hilariously, last century, many of the country's best private universities abandoned geography, leaving 21st century learners at private universities largely devoid of chances to learn about Arthur Robinson or Cindy Brewer, devoid of chances to read chapter five of Terry Slocum and Fritz Ketzler's textbook. Thankfully, many of the country's best public universities did not forsake geography. So if you're like me and you earned, I use the term earn loosely here, earned a PhD studying cartography in America in the 21st century, there's a very good chance you did so within a geography department at a large public university. 
In turn, there's a very good chance you have also experienced the great joys of working within social sciences in a public university environment in the 21st century. And it is that experience, the evolving experience, of cartography at public universities that I want to talk about for just a minute. As J.M. Kutseo recently wrote, as governments retreat from their traditional duty to foster the common good and reconceive of themselves as mere managers of national economies, universities have been coming under pressure to turn themselves into training schools, equipping young people with the skills required by a modern economy. One manifestation of this shift is seen in how our cartography professors are judged by their superiors. They are judged less and less based on their teaching and writings, and more and more on their abilities to stimulate their local college's own economy. Chances are, if you're like me, and you earned a PhD studying cartography in America in the 21st century, you have done so while being supported by the federal government. And at some level, that support was earned by proposing to do some mapping work to some federal agency. For me, it was the National Science Foundation and the Department of Transportation. But for many others, it's the National Institutes of Health, the Department of Defense, or the Department of Homeland Security. We can look at these support systems as contests. These agencies often hold contests for money. We submit research ideas, and if the deep-pocketed agencies love your ideas, they will sanction and support them. Hooray, then they'll put you on the front of the department newsletter. It's not hard to find your local university applauding or celebrating when their professors earn these stipends. It is hard to find them celebrating when a faculty member earns an unusually strong set of semester evaluations from his or her learners. With this in mind, we can also look at these support systems as ideological intruders. And it's not hard to argue that by allowing the transient and biased needs of the federal government to determine the merit of your cartographic scholarship is a misguided and short-sighted policy. In addition, it's not hard to argue that this framework also represents a massive departure from a more traditional vision for higher education or for collegiate teaching and learning. A vision that believes, as Kutsia says, indispensable to a democratic society, indeed to a vigorous national economy, is a critically literate citizenry competent to explore and interrogate the assumptions behind the paradigms of national and economic life reigning at any given moment. During my time as both a learner and a professor in the current cartographic education environment, I watched almost all of my colleagues attempt to contort and twist their expertises into forms they believed would be more attractive to the Shark Tank panelists doling out dollars from inside the beltway of our nation's capital. It was a practice I came to call cartography.gov. And make no mistake, I was right there with them. Boy, was I ever with them. I knew a bit about spatial analysis and a bit about cartography, but I didn't apply these skills to mapping flowers in the meadow or pretty peaches in the orchard. I knew better than that. I started mapping public health. I started mapping traffic on federal highways. Man, was I clever. By the time I finished my doctorate at UCSB, I won several research prizes from several different agencies. All my mentors agreed, even mean old Sarah Fabricant. I was definitely professor material. For centuries, cartographers like me have been running the errands of the king. It's not new. Perhaps no other discipline in the world is has been more tied to the government interests than our own. While the ideological intrusion of the government has overtaken much of the social science, it had overtaken our field long ago. Arthur Robinson, himself the father of American academic cartography, was a DOD man. Walter Tobler came from Rand. We shouldn't be surprised. The men in the video that was playing earlier are wearing government uniforms, building government maps for government wages and government interests. Many of us are more like those men than we might like to admit. Sure, the styles of our clothes might be different, those semiologies of our fabrics, but just like the hoodie look, we're too smart to be fooled by that. We may wear J. Crew or Suit Supply or L.L. Bean or Lane Bryant, 
But to be an academic cartographer in America in the 2000s almost always means we serve some government king somewhere. And just as the fellows in the video use tools bought and paid for by Uncle Sam, so do we. Indeed, many of the trips we took here tonight were paid for by our beloved uncle. Unfortunately, the exact same time we need to ramp up cartography.edu and help our learners find new ways to empower the big data era, particularly within domains that might be considered cartography.com, cartography.gov still seems to have its mitts all over our best teaching centers. And many of our best cartographic professors are institutionally compelled to spend many of their hours doing those cartography.gov projects. But before I veer off course into some unintended political essay, allow me to correct my course. After all, I'm just a man who maps basketball players. Now, I don't know if any of you have noticed, but our country is quite passionate about sports. <laughs> For all of the critical cartographers out there, Sports are activities involving physical exertion and skill in which an individual team competes against another or others for entertainment. And this, my patient, my patient friends, finally brings me to my comfort zone, mapping basketball players and away from my papers. So the NBA started collecting precise spatial shooting data for every NBA player way back in 2001, before I started grad school with Sarah Fabricant. I presented the paper that Wired ch claimed changed basketball forever at MIT in 2012. For all the critical cartographers out there, that's an 11 year gap. No, they can do math. I know, I can do math. This is the abstract that changed basketball forever, according to Wired magazine. Uh, there is an emerging need for spatially informed evaluations that can be effectively communicated to a diverse set of audiences. Enhanced spatial and visual analytics could be vital new tools for informing future game plans, personnel transactions, and practice regimens. I presented this paper in March of 2012 at MIT at a conference called the uh, MIT Sloan Sports Analytics Conference. Um, and that was pretty much the big inflection point in my career, March 2012. That was the day suddenly different kinds of people wanted to ask me about maps. That was the day Slate Magazine wanted to talk to me about an article they were writing called what geography can teach us about basketball. So I ask you guys, what can this paper and this idea about geography teaching us about basketball teach us about the ability of maps to teach us about stuff? <laughs> I used to be an internet writer. <laughs> Just the kind of stuff we know how to do. Early after I published that paper, I was, I was very energized intellectually. I felt like John Wesley Powell must have felt when he started exploring and mapping the American West. There was so much information and so many people yearning for that information. And uh, nobody was doing it. And so I spent a few years making as many maps, if you want to call them that, as I could, and sending them out on the internet. I'm no John Wesley Powell, but, you know, thanks to my friends uh, Jeremy White and some others, by June 2012, less than three or four months after I presented that paper, we led the New York Times for a full day with this MBA shooting interactive. My life was changing. I don't know what the next slide is. I've got to go back to my papers. Oh, yeah. One of the things, like this, this, this went viral. It won the New York Times some awards. Um, it was cool. I was really happy with it. It's still, to this day, one of the coolest things I've ever been a part of. 
But uh, I, I get to thinking about how this data set's been around for 11 years and change before this project comes out. And I think that's instructive. I think that's instructive. How could this data set be sitting there in a domain area that we're so obsessive about in our culture and nobody thought to map it? Nobody did this for 11 years. And I don't know how long it would have taken if I didn't do it 11 years later if somebody else, for somebody else to come along and do it. And I think that's something I want to leave you guys with, not that I'm done talking. <laughs> but think about that. 11 years in the 21st century, this data set was just sitting there and nobody thought to map it. So this is, this is some points I make to, to more general sports audiences when I get a chance to talk to them. And I say always there's two reasons why maps aren't more common in sports discourse. First is technology. Um, as many of you recall and lived through, it was expensive to produce maps and distribute maps for a long time. Um, and this is the Old Testament right there of sports analytics. Uh, and, and Mr. James, who is, is, is a legend, um, in the same way that Arthur Robinson is a legend, um, didn't put maps in his baseball abstracts each year, in part because technology it was very inefficient or costly. But that's not an excuse anymore. This is the real reason we don't see them more in sports discourse. Not enough people who call themselves analysts in the sports realm know how to make maps. They don't think about spatial data. They don't see a store of 11 years worth of spatial data and think, man, somebody should probably map that shit. <laughs> this brings me back to one of my heroes, Arthur Robinson, and that idea of graphicacy and how our universities, despite some of the best efforts of some people in this room, aren't really producing enough analysts that can do that. One of the other maps I always show are these beautiful NOAA maps. And I ask my audience in a sports context, do you think this is an analytic? Sports front office people are obsessed with analytics right now. Everybody wants to say they know how to use analytics, they do analytics, their team has analytics. But nobody really even knows what analytics means. Um, and so I like to ask people a question, is this an analytic? Um, not only do I believe it is an analytic, I always argue that it's the most potent analytical form in human history. It's the most potent reasoning artifact in human history. And for me, as many of you in this room know, my approach to quote unquote sports analytics has always had this as a central thesis. And I just fucking steal stuff. And I steal the idea of bathymetry maps and apply them to basketball maps. People think I'm smart. Last year, the NBA called me, and it was sort of a profound moment. They said, Kirk, we want to put up a mural in our office in New York, and we wanted to have an analytical theme. And so I said, well, what could we do? And they said, well, we have all that shooting data, you know, the stuff that only you know how to use. <laughs> I didn't tell them about all you guys. I'm not stupid. <laughs> I said, yeah, go on. They said, we're going to give you some money. And I said, yeah, go on. <laughs> we're gonna, we want you to build whatever you want. And then sort of the, the Easter egg I hid in this project is that 2002 to 2015 thing, that 11-year thing. And so what I did, and it's boring, 
to most of you, I divided the basketball court up into 11 zones that I often divide it up into. There are no tidy borderlines to neighborhoods, by the way. But uh, there aren't in basketball courts either. I put them there too. And I said, OK, let's figure out who the best shooters in these places are in the time that you guys have been collecting this incredible data and nobody's been using it. And I'll put it on your wall. So they think it's a monument to the analytics movement. I think it's a monument to the stupidity of their analytics. <laughs> As I said earlier, one manifestation of new priorities of public research universities is seen in how our cartography professors are judged by their superiors. Sometime in the fall of 2012, I was mailed my last merit document. I was visiting Harvard, but I was still a professor at Michigan State, which would have been my tenure home. Enclosed within, my superiors let me know that I was awarded 35 merit points for an article that to date had been downloaded 19 times. I had been awarded 50 points for a few state and federal grant awards. Meanwhile, that same rubric awarded me zero points for projects that had been consumed by millions uh, in publications such as ESPN, Grantland, and the New York Times. That was the moment I knew I could no longer be a cartography professor. I left academia in 2013. Please don't interpret my last few remarks as condemnation of any kind. The goal there was simply to say that when it comes to defining what is and what is not valuable cartography, that Western governments and public universities have a very loud voice. Especially for a field like ours, where the teaching and learning of the subject matter happens almost exclusively at public universities, especially at a time where our public universities are so bound to the want priorities of the governments they affiliate with. But just because government has such a loud voice and such a commanding grip on so many of our research resources does not mean other voices and other resources do not exist. It just means they're a little harder to find. I want to quickly refer to something Mark Harrower wrote about 10 years ago in a 2007 journal article in the context of animated mapping. Then Professor Harrower argued that cartography was experiencing something of a paradigm shift. When it comes to animated maps, the bottleneck is no longer the hardware, the software, or the data. It is the limited visual and cognitive processing capabilities of the map reader. It was a perfect and succinct way to say something that needed to be said. In the late 1990s, academic cartographers fretted over our limited abilities to build dynamic maps. We were constrained by primitive computational tools and a relative dearth of good spatio-temporal data. Back then, it was hard to make the kinds of interactive dynamic maps we take for granted today. And in 2007, Harrower correctly noted that those hindrances were rapidly fading. And to paraphrase a recent Nobel laureate, the cartographic times were a change in. A decade later, it's clear Harrow was spot on. The bottlenecks are no longer hardware, software, or data. In fact, in 2016, it's almost difficult to imagine those were ever bottlenecks at all, but they were. In 2016, we live in what many have labeled the big data era. In 2016, terms like data visualization and visual analytics are commonly heard almost everywhere. But as Professor Rob Edsel once pointed out to me a long time ago, one key reason these data sets are so big these days is that many of them include thousands or millions of precise spatial references. Spatial data is everywhere now. While it's fair to say that the lion's share of spatial data last century was probably housed in government servers, and much of it pertained to government interests, that is less true now than ever. In turn, many industries outside of the government are experiencing something of a spatial awakening. I happen to work in one such industry, but there are many beyond professional basketball, trust me. 
Just like the MBA, countless other domains are now facing huge challenges. Many of these challenges cannot be overcome without individuals that know how to handle spatial data. These challenges cannot be overcome without individuals that know how to map spatial data. And most important, these challenges cannot be overcome without individuals that know how to extract, transform, and load intelligence out of our growing databases into the hungry minds of citizens and workers everywhere. But to paraphrase Professor Kobe Bryant, these challenges are all an opportunity for cartography to rise. Ladies and gentlemen, in the big data era, there are many kings to serve. And if my bizarre career path instructs us of anything, it's that even mediocre cartographers are needed in places where they weren't needed before. Beyond places like pro sports and sports media, there are limitless opportunities for people for our, with our skill sets to rise. Sometimes these opportunities are hard to see. Other times they're obvious. The edges of the cartographic kingdom are wider now than they used to be. The big data era is the Louisiana purchase for our chosen trade. I was looking at an ultrasound image of my unborn child the other day and I wondered why in 2016 this visual artifact had all the same visual appeal as a SIMAP image from 1967. Then my mind wandered to MRI outputs and CAT scan imagery. These are the maps and charts of life and death, but you wouldn't know that just by looking at them. It's my belief that in the time of ubiquitous spatial data, that cartography is everywhere. Unfortunately, cartographers are not everywhere. Fortunately for me, though. <laughs> and this brings us back to the state of cartographic education in the big data era. And this also brings us back to a less rosy tone. Ladies and gentlemen, despite the best efforts of some great individuals in this room, cartographic education is in questionable shape. Thanks to the natural forces of the contemporary public university, our gaze is too narrow and our reach is too slight. While it's true that there's a hungry world out there dying to add legions of new map makers, we're not producing that many. And too many of the ones we are producing are too eager to serve Uncle Sam and not eager uh, enough to serve or apply their education and their skills in 21st century domains. In a tech-driven economy obsessed with data and analytics, too few of our graduates are finding ways to show the world how 21st century map making can empower 21st century progress. I want to pose to you two questions. Number one, how can we change this? I'm not sure, but my second question is a bit more discouraging. Number two, why have so many young, promising cartographers rejected the priesthood of academic cartography? Ladies and gentlemen, many of the best PhD graduates in cartography are choosing fields other than academics. Surely part of this has to do with the rising needs for our skills and industries thirsties for more and more visual reasoning. But part of this also has to do with the state of the public university, the state of the assistant professor, the state of tenure in places like Wisconsin, and the state of the discipline of geography. The Robbies, the Toblers, the Brewers of right now are exposed to seductions from cartography.com that weren't present a few decades ago. Moreover, they don't have places to teach at private schools and are also exposed to a public university system that is in worse condition than it was a few decades ago. Simply put, the industrial path is more alluring these days, while the academic trail is more crooked and less appealing than ever. In turn, you can find some of the most promising young PhDs in our field holding their office hours at weird places. You can find Professor Tim Wallace at the New York Times. You can find Professor Sarah Battersby at Tableau, Professor Ben Sheasley at Access Maps, and my old friend, Professor Mark Harrower at Esri. These employers either did not exist or are not interested in hiring cartography doctors a few decades ago. Perhaps the folks lured to these unconventional destinations are in a way turning a blind eye to the kinds of direct or indirect government research that now sits at the core of contemporary academic cartography. And perhaps we should see this new era of tech as an exciting new path toward non-government sanctioned cartography. 
I meant to start that up so they wouldn't just stare. But time is a revelator, and good young geographers have faced evolving job prospects for centuries. Humboldt had a royal expense account that allowed him to travel the world, climb mountains, measure everything, and report back. He served many kings, literally. A century or two later, a young Arthur Robinson emerged to find a very different cartographic landscape. And then academic cartography had a heyday. My point is that the prospects of our field are constantly in flux. And what we're seeing now is just the latest in a very long line of shifts in the cartographic marketplace. I can't speak for others, but earlier this decade, I chose to leave academic cartography for a few simple reasons. The first was money, but that's both an uncouth and unsurprising pull factor to dissect here this evening. The second is perhaps more troubling. I left my tenure track position for a career that promised more intellectual autonomy. I wanted to make maps and to write and to teach. And in 2007, when I got my job at a large land grant university, I was confident that I'd landed in a good place to do that. And I had. However, there were great constraints in place about which subjects I could map out, write about, or even teach about. As a young intellectual, I never felt particularly free on those Saturday mornings as I filled out government grant applications. And the broader impacts of that feeling compelled me to seek another outlet. As I alluded to earlier, cartographers have great vision. We can see teaching moments all over the place. But if my career path is instructive of anything, I think it demonstrates the point I made a few minutes ago. That in the big data era, cartographers are uniquely positioned to help us see and understand new worlds, worlds that may not be as literal as the one Humboldt explored and mapped out, but worlds that still hold tremendous interest to contemporary humanity. And if what Kobe Bryant says is true, the challenges are really just opportunities in disguise, then I'll leave you with a few opportunities I see. Number one, we have an opportunity to improve the state of cartographic education in America. Number two, from fabrics to traffics to mavericks and beyond. We now have an opportunity to apply our timeless skills in unconventional new ways that help humanity understand all of these big data sets. And lastly, we have an opportunity here in 2016. We can make America maps again. <laughs> Let's go get a drink. That's all I got. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks a lot, Kirk. Uh, we have time for a few questions. Do we? Yes. Okay. Before we drink. Who has a question for Kirk? I told you we didn't. Yeah, I, really, yeah. I wanted to go get drinks. Tell them. So I've been sitting here trying to figure out how to frame this question. I'm not sure it'll be entirely coherent, but um, a lot of us here who are cartographers didn't go through the academic. Uh, there is a long tradition of um, people doing other things and coming to cartography in the commercial field, especially out of all kinds of other trades. Uh, the general drafting was founded by people who did, uh, did drafting. Uh, a lot of people came out of surveying, out of other trades, out of just random stuff. I was, I was, an, I was an art major. Um, I've been thinking about the, the way that a lot of colleges have writing requirements, which is different from being English uh, majors, studying literature, going on to an academic career. Is there a place in the academy, not, I love geography departments and cartography programs, but is there a place for what you're talking about in encouraging literacy that's like the writing requirement, that is yeah. not trying to create more PhDs, but is trying to create a, a broad sense of literacy? That's a fantastic question, and you're right, there's no easy answer, but I do think when you sit back, my favorite map of the last 10 years is the wind map that Martin and Fernanda built. Um, you guys know what I'm talking about, right? Hint.fm, a gorgeous artifact. They're not geographers, and they figured out a way to map one of the most sort of primitive geographic phenomena in the world's history. And uh, 
You know, I think that's instructive in a couple of ways. One, you don't have to go through some sort of magical educational passageway to emerge capable of doing that. But it's also instructive of the, the idea that you need to, that the market demands so many of these people and, and the supply that we're, we're building. Um, you, don't, you don't see a lot of, say, uh, neurosurgeons that, that came out of uh, auto shops, you know. They, they all went to the, to the place to learn how to do that. Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's, you, can, you can read that several ways. Um, first of all, I don't think there's anything mess, magically you learn at a university or in a degree program. Uh, but secondly, I do think like in this computer science era, in this data analytics era, stats, all these sort of fields are, 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 are relevant. Um, and it's no surprise that we see people from other areas, whether it's engineering and drafting expertise contributing. And, you know, spatial reasoning isn't unique to geography or cartography. It's, it's, it's relevant, obviously, in architecture, in medicine, um, in interior design. Um, there's no reason why we have any kind of trademark on spatial reasoning. It just doesn't make sense. Um, and obviously, my work is the other way. I took a geographic education and applied it to sort of a non-geographic scale. Um, but it's an interesting question. And like you said, I don't have a clean answer for you on that. Um, I don't think there's anything holy about the monastery of PhD programs of geography. Uh, but I do think there's not enough of them. And I do think the fact that they don't exist even in, at private universities and our, some of our most prestigious universities is one reason we see people from other fields starting to, to sort of make maps and stuff like that. But I, I think, like, last thing, last thing, I think that we should have obviously more graphical learning. That's the point I was trying to make with that Robinson illusion early on, is, is that especially now when we're just all staring at screens all day long, that reading, writing, and arithmetic, and literacy, articulacy, and numeracy, it's not that they're less important, it's that graphicacy is, is joined. And there's, that's not being reflected in contemporary education at any level. Uh, thank you for your talk. It was really fascinating. Um, I'm wondering how you found that basketball data set. Yeah. And because um, you're talking about, you know, there are probably all these data sets sitting out there that a cartographer would love to get their hands on and just don't know that they're out there. Yeah. So how did you find that? And also, technical question, how is that data stored? Oh, gosh. <laughs> um. You know, I'm writing a book right now, and one of the first chapters is about how this project occurred. It had been in my head since I was a kid. Before, I, before my dad taught me how to use um, Logo on the Apple IIe, and uh, before I took any of Cindy's classes at Penn State, as a basketball player, I was really aware that I was somewhat adequate as a jump shooter in some spots and somewhat inadequate to be kind to myself in other spots. There's the spatial sort of heterogeneity in my ability. Anyway, it was in my head for a long time, and as I developed my skills in cartography, I started to wonder, shouldn't we be showing this? And so I've been searching for this data for a long time, um, and I remember talking to friends at UCSB about it, um, and, and again, that was 2006, 2007. It wasn't until 2011 where I found uh, and a way to scrape data from ESPN. So ESPN was publishing shot locations for individual games. So Kobe shot 18 times tonight, here are those 18 dots. They're hollow if you missed, they're filled if you made it. And then as a cartographer and an analyst, I knew on aggregate there was a much more interesting story there. Um, and so I scraped those with my very, very bad scraping skills. As I said earlier, I'm an idiot. Um, but that data is, is stored now several different ways. Now, actually, <clears throat> and part of the talk I cut is 
I started a research group at Harvard called XY Research with a statistician named Luke Bourne. And after I presented at MIT, I was, I was approached by a company called Stats Inc. from Chicago. And they were installing these cameras in all the NBA arenas that were tracking players 24 times a second. So they were essentially recording the, 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 the spatial location of 14 things 24 times a second. Uh, 10 players, a basketball, and three referees. And it was in this incredible space-time data set. And that was stored in XML. Uh, and when they sent that to me, they sent that to me at the conference and said, hey, Kirk, you know, you made these great charts with this other data set. You want to mess with this space-time data set? And of course I said yes, because this, is, this at the time was the holy grail of, of sports analytics. And uh, when I first opened that file, that first XML file, I had just, just this huge array of XML tags and numbers. And my first reaction was, uh, oh my god, this is a lot of data. And then my second reaction was, oh shit, this is only four seconds of a game. <laughs> <laughs> and that I had thousands of these files in this directory. Uh, and so I did what any good cartographer would do. I called somebody with actual skills. <laughs> and I said, hey. And so, you know, I say that in jest, but also, and I don't know what this says about our society, it's a point I often make, that even Luke and I, who's one of the best young spatial stats people in the world right now, he was saying, this is the best space-time data set in the world, and it's about basketball. Um, I don't know what that says about our priorities as a culture. Uh, but what we did was we, we ended up getting in some of the top stats journals four or five times in a two-year span just trying to solve these basic space-time stats problems. Um, it's hard. Um, but anyway, that's a long way of saying there's two data sets. The, the shot data is really easy. It's, it looks like a... a, a, a typical GIS data file with X, Y locations, a player's name, and whether the shot went in. Um, and then there's this other tracking data that we work with a lot now in the NBA that is not simple and is stored in very different ways that your, your friendly ArcGIS or Cardo DB or whatever might not like to handle very well. Um, and it's just very challenging. So that's another point. One more question? This is a question actually from Twitter I read. Um, are there other uh, sports spatial data sets out there like basketball? I guess the major four in the US plus f football, European soccer. Um, and uh, are people doing what, you're, what you have done in the NBA? Uh, yeah, it's a fantastic question. Um, the, the, my friend Luke, who I just alluded to, is currently running a similar department as I am with the Spurs for AS Roma in Italy, um, which is one of the top European soccer clubs. Same player tracking data, same sort of analytical riddles, same incredible amounts of intelligence waiting to be extracted. Um, out there is the two words that I'd like to meditate on for just a second. They're, they exist, but they're not out there. Uh, and this is another sort of problem with 21st century cartography. Some of the best data sets in the world are being collected by companies like Apple, Facebook, um, IBM, whatever. But they're not out there. Uh, they don't share those. You don't download those like the census data I grew up downloading for cartography labs. Um, those are the really challenging, incredible data. And they exist for sports like tennis, basketball, soccer, uh, baseball, football. But they're, on, uh, they're behind the kind of locked server walls that Hillary Clinton should have had. You can't, you can't get at them. Um, and that's like a philosophical debate, you know? As an American growing up with government data, you're kind of like, come on, guys, transparency, transparency. And these businesses have decided that's not the way they're going to run it. So the, the answer to your question is yes, they are there, uh, but they are not out there. One last question. 
Uh, thank you for your talk. Uh, fantastic. Um, uh, I agree that uh, we need more education in this area. I also agree that big data uh, poses a huge opportunity, and it does sound like bigcartography.com is creating a lot of suction out of the universities, but won't that, or are they, maybe I should ask, uh, putting a demand on the universities to produce more cartographers to uh, create interns, to create uh, people, you know, co-op programs and things like that where people can come in into the corporate world, and won't that stimulate more activity in the educational realm? It's a fantastic question. You said some of the things I wanted to say better than I could say them. Um, there is a suction. I guess I'm cynical to the point where I don't, I don't see the, 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 the portability of the, the public universities. It's not movable in the sense that they're established classes, you try to get a new class on the books at some of these universities, it's like you're asking for the world. Um, so I mean, yeah, I mean, I think the big data era should be a stimulant for cartographic education, visualization education, and it has been, to be fair. Uh, but I haven't seen it at the magnitude I would like to see it at, at the places where I learned or taught at. Uh, and I think that's important. You do see places. Um, like at the University of Washington where really nice visualization labs are emerging or stuff like that. Um, but honestly, like if you look at the job ads at the back of the AAG, you don't see this. Oh my God, we got to react to this. I don't see it. Maybe you guys do, but I haven't seen that. And I think that's a little bit discouraging. So I do think, again, trying to say challenges or opportunities, like we do have an opportunity to wake up to this thing and, 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 and make geography relevant. I appreciate your point. All right. Thank you, guys. <laughs>